chapter 16, the final chapter of the Wreck of the Titan, and this one's short, page and a half, not even. On the morning of the next day, a one-armed dock lounger found an old fish hook and some pieces of string which he knotted together. Then he dug some bait and caught a fish. Being hungry and without fire, he traded with a coaster's cook for a meal, and before night caught two more, one of which he traded, the other sold. He slept under the docks, paying no rent, fished, traded, and sold for a month, then paid for a second-hand suit of clothes and the service of a barber. His changed appearance induced a boss Steve Dorr to hire him tallying cargo, which was more lucrative than fishing, and furnished in time a hat, pair of shoes, and an overcoat. He then rented a room and slept in a bed. Before long, he found employment, addressing envelopes for a mailing firm, at which his fine and rapid penmanship secured him steady work, and in a few months, he asked his employers to endorse his application for a civil service examination. The favor was granted, the examination easily passed, and he addressed envelopes while he waited. Meanwhile, he bought new and better clothing, and seemed to have no difficulty in impressing those whom he met with the fact that he was a gentleman. Two years from the time of his examination, he was appointed to a lucrative position under the government, and as he seated himself at the desk of his office, could have been heard to remark, Now John Rowland, your future is your own. You have merely suffered in the past from a mistaken estimate of the importance of women and whiskey. But he was wrong, for in six months he received a letter in part which read as follows. Do not think me indifferent or ungrateful. I have watched from a distance while you have made your wonderful fight for your old standards. You have won, and I am glad and I congratulate you. But Myra will not let me rest. She asks for you continually and cries at times. I can bear it no longer. Will you not come and see Myra? And the man went to see Myra. The end of The Wreck of the Titan or Futility. Published in 1898, 14 years prior to the wreck of the Titanic. The last time I read that was in one of my early years of high school, which I think was over 10 years ago. Yeah, I would say 11 years ago was when I last read that book. And um, I took a class called Ancient Mythology, which was actually an excellent class because it, it really dealt more with literature and um, how different stories from different cultures are written. And at some point during that year we had to write an essay about a story, a book. It didn't have to be ancient literature, but just any any book that dealt with one of the six conflicts that you find in literature. Man versus man, man versus society, man versus God, man versus nature, man versus self, man versus technology. And one of the things we learned is that most books and stories generally deal with just one and focus on that. And I made the argument, focusing on this book, I picked this story, and I made the argument that it dealt with everyone, all of these conflicts. Um, man versus man. And that's where you have a conflict against someone else, and another person, man or woman, but an individual. And he had several individual enemies. There was Myra Sr. There was the husband. There was um, the captain, the first officer, the uh, underwriter. He had a lot of enemies throughout this that he had to individually take on at different times. Man versus society. He was arrested, he was put on trial, he was um, knocked down to rock bottom and he had to build himself back up at the end. He was fighting against society or at least struggling for himself to bring himself up through society. Man versus self where you are your own enemy. And uh, he had this as well, his drinking problems, with his lack of responsibility, but when he finally had a purpose, which before protecting the child, before the wreck, his purpose that he adopted for himself was to stand up for what was right, stand up for the royal age. He didn't know the name of the ship yet, but stand up for the ship that they cheese knifed. So he was battling against himself, trying to become a better person become a better man and become a more respectable figure. 
Man vs. Technology, which is probably the lesser of all of these, because he wasn't exactly fighting against technology, but he was on the Titan, a massive ocean liner which went down. He had a struggle against it a little bit, and he had a struggle against his duties on board it. That would probably be the least of all. Man vs. Nature, which kind of blends with Man vs. God, but I make a distinction that God is a very different category in this case. But let me go on to Nature first. Uh, man vs. Nature because he's on an iceberg. He's in essentially an Arctic environment, battles a polar bear, he's lost at sea, and he has to survive and protect a child. Man vs. God is separate in this case because he, throughout it on occasion, has this religious, spiritual struggle inside himself and he feels like he's actually singled out to be picked on by God, if God exists, which he is uncertain of. And he does sit down and pray, and uh, moments after praying he is saved. There's no follow-up on that. There's no finding out if his faith has developed or not. It's just this interesting coincidence, and he questions it, and then he forgets about it for the rest of the book. Wreck of the Titan contains all of these struggles, which, and, and it's well written, especially when dealing with his soliloquy. So I feel like this is, um, even though it's a little dated, is actually a fantastic story, even aside from the, uh, the, the infamous attention it gets for predicting the Titanic disaster. And as I said, I don't think it predicted Titanic. I think it just predicted Leonardo DiCaprio. We have Titanic, The Revenant, Great Gatsby, Wolf of Wall Street sprinkled in a little bit there, getting drugged up and feeling like everyone's against him, Shutter Island. The similarities are striking. They're striking but predictable. Um, there's no doubt that this is a really interesting coincidence. Whether there's any sort of premonitions going on or, or um, prophecies is... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to really venture a guess, but I'm certainly skeptical. Um, ships were already this impressive in 1898. The German lines were, were really cranking ships out before Cunard built the Lusitania and the Mauritania, and well before White Star Lines, Olympic, and Titanic. The German ships, like the Kaiser Wilhelm de Rosa, uh, which I believe was already out in 1898, they were, they were like this. They were that size. They weren't that heavy. No ships were that heavy for a very long time. But they were that length, and they were that width, and they did have that speed. So calling her, or, or making a big deal about a ship being that big is actually a little outdated by 1898. In fact, the Great Eastern was almost that length. It was, it, it was almost 800 feet. It was it's like 700 feet. I can't remember offhand. But the Great Eastern was the late 1850s. And it had all of these special features. It had all of these luxuries. It was that big. It had a theatrical group, I think. It had musicians and brass bands and performers. And it had the best of the crew. And it had the telegraph indicators was one of the biggest things that they talk about as being advanced technology. Well, that was technology that was already 20 years old. Because that was on the Atlantic and the Oceanic and the Republic and Baltic. The first White Star Line ships after its reboot. So... Predicting the technology, what a lot of people like to say, oh, it's eerily like the Titanic because it's big. No, it, it's not. That's predictable. Calling it the Titan obviously is very striking compared to the Titanic. But Titans were, in Greek mythology, giants. They were, well, not giants, because giants was a separate race, but they were also giants of, their own, of themselves. I don't know why the author picked Titan as, as the name of the ship. That's striking, not going to lie. But there's a bunch of other significant differences, too. Titanic didn't have sails. Titanic had 20 lifeboats, not 24. It did go down in April, and it did hit an iceberg, but it did not go down in, like, five minutes. It did not crash up onto the iceberg and roll off onto its side, smashing off a bunch of debris onto the iceberg. And it did not have a tiny handful of survivors. It had 700. I mean, it sounds to me like you could count the number of survivors on your fingers of the Titan. 
And you also have to keep in mind that the Titan is only in the first third of the story. It's not the central figure. It's the catalyst to this man's journey, but um, it is not the, the central figure of the, of the story. And one of the big similarities that I keep reading online every time I see the clickbait come up about how the Titan predicted the Titanic is they like to say that, uh, that the people died on the Titan because there weren't enough lifeboats. The people died on the Titan because the ship sank too fast. Yeah, there weren't enough lifeboats, but that was irrelevant because they couldn't get the ones away. Although, Titanic did not have enough lifeboats either. But this was also irrelevant because they only, they, they, they had 20 on board, they only got 18 away. The remaining two had to float off. I firmly believe that if they had enough lifeboats on board for all, wouldn't have made much of a difference. Sure, you could have saved a few more, a couple dozen more, absolutely, and that would have been worth it. I'm not arguing that, but you wouldn't have saved everybody. Just like on the Titan, the ship was going down and it was going down fast. There was no way to evacuate everybody. So, going back to the literary elements of the book, I, I also made the argument that it has the hero's journey of, um, of ancient literature in this. He starts off with sort of like a neutral life. It's not a great life. He, he is a drunk. He, uh, he longs for a woman he cannot have. But then he faces this call to action. He was there when the Titan cheese knife, the little ship, and uh, he has to choose, am I going to stand up for what's right, or am I going to be like every other crewman here and take the bribe and just stay quiet? And he chose right there, no, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this call to action, I'm going to go for it. And it started beating him. It started pulling him down, and then of course when the ship went down, which uh, I, I don't have the hero's journey that well memorized, but he, he went through the gates of hell and into the belly of the beast. He fought a beast on the, on the iceberg and he was defending Myra. He had someone who was looking out for him with Captain Brady Bartley, the other guy who punched everyone on his behalf. Barry? Barry Bartlett, Burry, Burry Barty, something like that. Captain Buddy, Captain Bro. <laughs> he returns to his lifestyle, but, but not quite. He can't go back to working on a ship. He has an O hand. Kind of inhibits your working on a ship. Um, but he's once again sent to rock bottom. Thanks to Myra. And then he works up. He gains, so it, so it doesn't even have a real happy ending because it kind of ends. And then it kind of sort of gives this epilogue where then you are left with a happy ending, but it's, it's left open. What happens? Does he go and visit Myra? Does he just remain friends with Myra? And does he contend himself with that? Or does something develop with Myra Sr.? We don't know. There's no sequel. Although, Morgan Robertson, the author of this, did go on to write a few other books, which are all in this, or at least the best ones are, um, in this printing, which I have, so if you're looking for a good copy, this one has a few of his other books in it. He wrote another book called Beyond the Spectrum, where the countries of the world are building up tensions, and, um, and then it start, the, they, they break out into war. But the war is triggered by, I think it was Japan. If it's not Japan, it's, it's one of the Asian countries. Surprise attacking the United States in the Pacific. And then the war goes on to bring almost every nation in the world involved. But the war ends with a deadly weapon and two giant explosions. So that is beyond the spectrum, which was written in 1914. And then he died in Atlantic City, New Jersey, in 1915. I think of a drug overdose. And then he wrote something about pirates. I don't know, I didn't read it. There you go. The Wreck of the Titan, or Futility, 
by Morgan Robertson, written in 1898, 14 years prior to the sinking of the Titanic. What do you think? Do you think this was a premonition? Do you think this was a coincidence that he was able to come up with just by following the patterns of the industry with, with some interesting admitted coincidences, but still nothing out of the ordinary? What do you think? Leave a comment below, and uh, what are your thoughts on, on the book? Did you enjoy it? Did you not? Did you think it was weird? I thought it was weird, but awesome. Thank you for listening, and uh, I'm tired. This was a very long reading.